you have joined us in a series that I'm calling um, A Heart Like God's. So I'm going to get you to follow me back there a little bit, Philip, and throw up some of these passages. I have an actual heart in there because part of what we're talking about in this series is the phenomenon that happens with physical heart transplants. And how many of you find that interesting so far? If you are unaware, let me bring you up to speed quickly. Uh, you know, so in Christianity, you start talking about the heart and immediately people say, well, the heart's wicked, the heart's deceitful, the heart's evil, you can't trust it. Except that one of the greatest promises of the new covenant is Ezekiel 36, where we get a new heart. Say, I have a new heart. Colossians 2, God does a surgery on you and he removes the old heart. He removes the body of the sins of flesh and he puts a new heart on the inside of you. That's your inner being. That's the deepest part of you. The heart is described as where the word goes. The word dip, deep, you know, digs deep down into your heart from that spiritual place and bears fruit into your life. So the, the heart is kind of this place, this area between spirit and and soul and the rest of your being where you put the word on the inside of there because the word is alive. And I'm not just talking about you just read the Bible. I mean, you want to live your life disciplined by God's logic. You want to live your life in a way that says, okay, I'm doing this, but God's prescription and design to how to live life says this, I need to change the way that I'm thinking, come into agreement with what he says, and then put a plan into place to actually live that way otherwise known as repentance, right? Repentance is not when you beg God for forgiveness and you convince him how sorry you are and then he decides to forgive you. Forgiveness is in the blood of Christ. But repentance is in disciplining your mind and your heart to actually live out the word of God, the logic of God, the way that God thinks. We're talking about your money, your, your relationships, your career, your purpose, your ministry, all of that stuff. Go to the word, find out what it says, develop a plan and actually take those steps, amen? And, and that's what we want to do. That's what we constantly want to do in this place is help you sow that word inward, inwardly. And we're using the illustration of physical heart transplants, which I'm not going to go back through that. I'll just quickly say there is research now that shows that the physical heart has neurons, ha has like 40,000 of these kinds of cells that are like brain cells. So when the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Neurocardiology is actually showing us now that we think with our hearts. Your heart is part of the decision-making process. So your heart has the capacity to think and remember. And then we're looking at some of these heart transplant stories. Phenomenons like a recipient of a new heart having dreams and visions that lead to solving crimes because the person that gets the new heart starts having an image and a vision in their mind of somebody that committed a crime. And they create a sketch of that and then they go, I'm, there's kids in here so I'm not going into the, they, you guys got on to me last week, you're like trying to keep it lighthearted and you're like talking about murder. <laughs> so we're not gonna talk about that today. <laughs> uh, but then other, even little funny little things like where a recipient gets a new heart, a physical heart, and then starts to like music that the donor liked or starts to crave the kinds of foods that the donor liked or starts to think a certain way and make decisions and have life interests based on how that person lived their life. It's as if their deeper beliefs about themselves get recorded into their heart. That stuff's programmed into the physical heart. It goes into a recipient and then that person somehow activates the memories out of those neurons in that heart and actually starts to think and like they like that person thought, like liking football, liking chicken wings. And, and it's just an interesting phenomenon. So then you think about God gives us a new heart when we get born again. And I think it's like David said, create in me a clean heart. I think you have a clean heart. Now, I'm not saying we need to live a life where we follow our heart. You need to follow God, but the condition of your heart will determine how you follow God. Are you with me? So above all else, guard your heart, protect it, because out of your heart flows everything. What you believe in your heart, and, and it's interesting because we're talking about that kind of that spiritual heart, the soulish heart. When you look into the Hebrew, you know, it doesn't really make a distinction when it talks about lab, 
the Hebrew word for heart in terms of the function of it. It doesn't really say, well, this is your spiritual heart, this is your soulish heart, this is your physical heart. And I'm not saying your physical heart is your spiritual heart, because <laughs> I don't think we can understand all that. But we do know that we can clearly understand the things that are seen, or that are unseen by looking at the things that are seen. So then you think about this. Okay, I've got a new heart from God. He put his heart in me and it's programmed with his commandments. And he says, from this new heart and my spirit in you, I will cause you to keep my statutes. So you, get, you, talk, you hear from these people that get these heart transplants and they say it's almost as if somebody else is living on the inside of them, driving them to desire these new foods, liking football, liking exercise, even falling in love with the spouse of the donor's heart. I'm telling you, if this is interesting to you, go look it up. I've made some posts on Facebook about it. And then we also have a private Facebook group for the church. If you're interested in being part of that, uh, you can go find it, search uh, for church online community and we'll add you in there. We're, you know, we just, it's not a, it's just not out there. We, it's kind of a home team type thing. But if you want to get in there, let us know. I post a lot. I look at it as a giant discipleship group. There's like 1200 people in there now. And it's all over the world and people get to meet each other in there. Um, but I post extra stuff in there. Like I saved y'all from an hour long worth of me just talking about neuroscience last week or two weeks ago. <laughs> and it's not that I'm super smart. It's just, I just think it's interesting to me. It, so for me, looking at that kind of stuff helps me understand and it grows my faith in the reality of God working in our lives. You know, for me, I like it to be grounded. I'm not trying to put God in a box. I'm not trying to rule out spiritual phenomenon, but I don't, I, for me, the mystical side of the mystery, you know, I, I like to understand. I think God actually can work with us and give us a faith that's rooted and grounded where we're not mystical and we're not chased by because the bird flew south this direction and so we look up the direction of the northwest trajectory and now Psalm 116 because of the direction means this and I don't really know but it sounds good. <laughs> I'm going to live my whole life now because of the direction that bird flew. <laughs> now, that's not, I'm not throwing Adam under the bus with your bird story. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a lot of birds. <laughs> I, it, it actually reminded me of a story when I was uh, when I was walking out my deliverance, and you know I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Got into drugs, got possessed, hearing voices, dark as the dark gets. Trying to walk out of that, trying to trust God through the process, and I, you know, when I made the decision to try to trust Him and, and actually believe that I could live a life, you know, with Him, one there was one morning where I woke up and. And I, I just remember thinking, you know, Lord, I, I need to see some kind of interaction in this realm that is real to me because I was kind of like in between the spiritual and real and it felt like my mind was on drugs for my, almost a year. And that's, you know, unfortunately, that's what drugs will do to you. It, 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 all right, here we go. Let me stay on track. I'll just say there's people that watch this because they're interested in the things that we talk about and you're, you're experimenting with psychedelics because it seems to be mimicking a spiritual experience. And it's a shortcut. Uh, it, 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 first off, it's illegal. It's unwise. It will wreck your soul. But it does affect your physiology where you do become sensitive to that spirit. We're partially spiritual. We have the capacity to hear God's voice, to hear angelic choruses, to hear demonic messages. And when you affect your physiology in a way that kind of, I don't really know how to explain it all, but it causes you to be, it's like fasting, right? How many of you believe fasting makes you more sensitive to God's voice? It's the same type of thing. And it's not that because you fasted, God says, oh, look, they're fasting. Now I'm going to talk to them more. No, you quiet down that physical side of you. You quiet down the part of you that has natural desires and, and, you, and it heightens your spiritual sensitivities. Psychedelics does the same thing. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> but it's unwise. So anyway, I was in this place. I was talking about birds. 
And I just remember walking out one morning because we had these glass windows outside the bedroom where I was. And man, I'm telling you, there must have been 500 blue jays just on the ground. I mean, in this area, it probably as big as this room, just scattered all around, dense. And I, and I walk out and I'm looking at them and it, you know, very much the same thing. I just felt, you know. So I think God will do those kinds of things for you. Now, but I don't want to anchor my faith in those kinds of things. Like in other words, I don't want to anchor how I make decisions solely in those kinds of things. I want the Word of God bearing fruit on the inside of me, teaching me wisdom, helping me know who I am in Christ, helping me be confident in who, what God said. And all of that stuff is fine. You know, it can confirm who we are in Christ. It can verify the words spoken. It can help us and, and, you know, we can give each other words and all that kind of stuff. But man, please don't anchor everything into that. If you're desperate and you're looking for a word, be careful. Know who you are in Christ. Go to the Word. Know what it says about that area of life. Anchor your understanding and what God says about a subject, and then let it be confirmed. Are you with me? Yeah. So, this idea of we have a new heart, you have a responsibility to guard and protect this new heart, because that's where the Word goes. The love of God is shed abroad in that new heart. The light of God is poured out in that heart. Out of the heart flows every area of your life. And what we know about the heart, it's where we believe. It's with the heart that we believe unto righteousness. Are you with me? So what you actually believe is not really in your brain. Even from the soulish spiritual perspective, the inner core deepest part of who you are, you know, it's almost like on your heart you have a self-portrait. You have this painting of who you think you are and what you think you look like. And this happens at a subconscious level. This happens at a level where you don't really think about it. Because how many of you have found yourself in a situation and you're thinking, why did I say that? What happened? What was I thinking? Well, you weren't thinking. It's just in there and it's a reaction. Now, you, and so based on this, what we understand about physical hearts, we spend a lifetime programming that physical heart to crave and desire and believe things. So it is with your spiritual heart as well. You get a new one, but if you focus on, if you let, if you entertain carnality, you still entertain sin, you still entertain that new age and, 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 and chasing money, and, and then, the, then you give an avenue for the enemy to reinforce the corruption that maybe you have sown back into your heart again. It's not that your heart becomes evil, but that new heart, even that new heart, it has eyes. Pray that your, you know, the eyes of your heart be enlightened, right? So the eyes of your heart are looking for evidence. The eyes of your heart are looking, and it can look to the Spirit or it can look to this dimension. And you know what I'm talking about. Inwardly, where we don't even really think about it, we're looking. Okay, let's see. I need some evidence in this situation. Where am I going to look? Am I going to look to the Word of God? Am I going to look to a testimony that I remember hearing? Am I going to look to a course that really helped me understand this. And I don't understand what's going on right now, but I'm going to make sure that I trust the Word of God and I'm going to make a decision accordingly because I believe it'll bear fruit in my life if I actually make the decision according to God's logic. Or I just don't understand. You know, I don't really know. I know God says this, but I got this opportunity right here, so this is what I'm going to do. Well, that didn't work out. I don't understand. God, you didn't come through for me. And then you sing a song like today, God, you'll never let me down. And you're thinking in your mind, I don't know if I believe that. Yeah. Don't raise your hand. But when we were singing that song today, how many of you were questioning and wondering, oh, I'm, do I really believe that? Be honest with yourself. What, what is the phrase? God, you'll never let me down. You're never going to let me down. Don't raise your hand. But when we were singing that song today, how, how many of you were thinking? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I kind of feel like you may have let me down here. I kind of want you to raise your hand, but don't raise your hand. <laughs> Ask that question inwardly. God, was I, did I really believe that? So, so but that, what that tells me is what is your faith anchored in? What is your expectation anchored in? 
Now, all of this to say we can write the truth of God on our hearts so that we naturally, organically believe the Word of God, host the opportunity for the Word of God to bear fruit in your life. And as you do this, what it does is it teaches your mind how to then perceive and recognize God in this dimension. In other words, God, I promise you, listen, I promise you, God is trying to lead you in this life. Every day he's coming to you by his spirit and he's saying, go this way, make this decision. You can have this. This is who you are in this situation. Don't do that. If you do that, it's going to go really bad for you. And it's not with a threat of punishment because Jesus has already bore the penalty for that sin. But if you go that way, what he knows is that sin will produce death in and of itself. But he's trying to safeguard you from that. He's trying to deliver you from that. He's trying to lead you and guide you into abundant life. Jesus said, I've come that you would have life and that more abundantly. Are you with me? Every moment of every day, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the designer of humanity, the judge, the merciful one is looking at you, seeking how he can bless you. Not just so that you, you know, financially and all that stuff, not the prosperity gospel type thing, but so that you can be a blessing. God's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. But here's the thing. How are you hearing? Where is your heart? Where is your expectation? Last week we talked about hope. Hope basically means expectation. And then when you have a New Covenant biblical perspective of hope, it's a joyful and confident expectation of salvation. And salvation is the word soteria, healing, wholeness, soundness, preservation, rescue, deliverance from messianic judgment, prosperity, all of the stuff. Say all the stuff. (laughs) This is what hope does. And you have to choose what your hope is in. And it's difficult when you have a child that's suffering. It's difficult when you came out of a background or you had abusive parents. It's difficult if your loved ones are diseased or struggling with some type of disorder. You know, they're not, that didn't happen to them because God did that or allowed that. The world is broken. The world looks like it does because God gave the planet to us for a while and we chose to go our own path. We sown sin, which produced death. That's the reason there's sickness and all that stuff. Because if you want to know what God's will is, you look at the garden when he created it before sin and it was perfect. Then you look in the middle, Jesus, he came and he healed people and fed people and forgave people. And then in the end, what's heaven like? That's God's will. Everything else in between is he gave us this planet and look what we've done to it. But he also gave us his spirit to make a difference. Are you with me? Now, what you let yourself believe in your heart will come out without you even thinking about it. Be very, very careful. The paths of logic that you let your mind go down when you're dealing with highly emotional situations because it will write beliefs on your heart. It just does. And, the, and it will affect how you see yourself, which will then affect how you make choices. Are you with me? And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about writing the truth of God on our heart. And so choosing hope is a factor. Choosing hope is a, a way that you can influence your heart to trust God. You're collaborating with the word that's sown in there. You're hosting the spirit of God on the inside of you to let it grow. Amen. Another way that you can sow, and I'm probably going to say something like this, so follow me along if you would back there. Thank you. Um, Another way is cultivating faith. You know, we're talking about faith, hope, and love in terms of intentionally persuading this new heart to stay focused on the Lord. Are you with me? So faith, say faith. faith. Let me just ask you, I'm going to make you think here for a minute. What is faith? This is participatory. Just you can say out. What is faith? Substance of things hoped for. 
fully convinced God can do what he says he can do, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What else? What is faith? The opposite of fear. Opposite of fear trust. Any more? Belief. Belief. Taking, Taking action. action. Yep. Because you, you don't know if you really believe unless you act on it. Belief. Good job. Not one person said belief in spite of lack of evidence. Because that's what most people think faith is. That's what a lot of the world thinks about our faith. And oftentimes we think that. Well, I don't see how this is going to work, but I'm going to believe it anyway. That's not really faith. I don't know what to do here, but I think it's, you know what I'm saying? Did I just take away your definition of faith? It's like, wait a minute, that's what I was thinking. Oh, that's what you're laughing at. He stole my punchline. Sorry, I throw these little corny graphics. Put, put, so go to the next one if you would. So let me just talk about a little bit about faith. You know, so faith is not a commodity that you have to try to figure out how to get more of. Are you with me? Faith is not this thing that you can make stronger and build up more to get more stuff from God. There's a, there is kind of a swath in the body of Christ that teaches that by your faith, you can move God to do things for you. But really what faith is, is it's a response. Mm -hmm. If Jesus were to appear in front of you and say, I, the Lord God Almighty, will do so-and-so, so-and-so, and you say, yes, you are, and yes, you can, that's faith. You have responded to what he said. Mm -hmm. You have responded to what he initiated. You have chosen to believe what God has proclaimed about himself. Are you with me? So faith is not something that's like, oh man, I don't really know how to trust God. I don't really know how to do all these things. I need to figure out how to get really good. And when I do it, when I obey, because there is, I mean, like she said, faith without obedience is not really trusting. You might mentally agree, but if you're not acting on it, it really is not coming out of your heart. Faith is not what you do to get God to respond to you. Faith is a response to what God has done, who he says he is, and everything that Christ accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. Faith is a response. So in other words, Jesus has done this. I now can expect that. I can have hope in that. Yes. By his stripes we're healed. The reason that you can expect to be healed is because Jesus on that cross paid for your sin. And so in paying for sin, that means the penalty against sin and the effects of sin have all been addressed in his body. And what are the, what's the wages of sin? Death. Death. Death is not life. So in his body, not only did he bear the penalty for your sin, praise God for that, say thank you Jesus, thank you, Jesus. but the effects of that sin birthed fully into his body. The punishment and the wrath of God toward that sin on Christ, but then the effects of the death or, or the sin inside of him came to full fruition so that he can give you life. Are you with me? Like you have to understand the exchange part of what happened in the cross. Now, if regarding faith or, or healing, you think, well, I have to go to the person with the special gift of healing to get healed. That, that's not really faith. Or if you think, uh, let's see, I haven't repented enough, so therefore that disqualifies me to be healed. So now what I need to do is I need to figure out who I need to forgive. I need to figure out what curse I need to break. I need to figure out what soul tie to cut. I need to figure out what seed I need to sow. As if, now you would never consciously say that thing qualifies you for healing, but you might think the lack of that thing disqualifies you for healing. Right. Both equally wrong. The reason you are qualified for healing is because Jesus bore the effect of your sin on the cross, which makes you legally uh, qualified for healing. Are you with me? Yep. Now, 
you might need to deal with unforgiveness in your heart because it's, it's affecting your competence to trust him to the point where you let that bear fruit in your life. You let the seed of Christ unto healing bear fruit in your life. Do you see the difference? So we're not talking about some legal structure of taking action, which then somehow spiritually qualifies you for this blessing. No, you have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I don't think there's a single person, mostly in the body of Christ, if somebody was sick on this standing right here, and Jesus himself walked into that, to the room, came up front, asked the person, what is it that I can do for you? And that person said, I believe you can heal me. I'd like for you to heal me of this. What would happen if Jesus put his hand on that person and prayed for them? Do you have any doubt at all that Jesus can do that? Do you have any doubt at all that he wants to do that? Okay, so that's what you got to anchor your faith in, the character of God. Because when you look in the scripture and we have this body of evidence of Jesus, we have Jesus' track record laid out in front of us, never one time did he deny anybody of healing. Are you with me? Now, whatever kind of theological background we grow up in will cloud how we understand and see these kinds of things, right? And then, unfortunately, we spend a lifetime of programming our heart with circumstantial theology. In other words, we believe things based on what we've been through rather than I'm going to believe what the Word of God says. This is not my reality in this. You know, there's a difference between truth and reality. God's Word is always true, but your reality, it's real to you. Lack, depression, anxiety, sickness, disease, disappointment, that stuff's real. We're not denying that it's real. It's real. It is a reality. It's just not the effect of truth, which you could have the effect of truth because Christ is on the inside of you. Are you with me? And we're not just talking about healing. We're just talking about you wake up in the morning and you don't have that sinking feeling of, oh man, my future is, I'm doomed. Or, gosh, I'm probably really never going to be where I thought I was. I'm 30, 40 something years old now and this is where I'm at now and I always thought I had these dreams and I'm just having to come to the reality that this is probably not, and I'm kind of a loser. <laughs> I'm not all that I thought I was. I am not as smart as my mama Ted told me I was going to be, you know. So then, so then what happens? You start to believe that kind of, now it might be true. <laughs> you might never be the thing that you've dreamed of. So what? So what? What's life about anyway? If it's not glorifying him, right? right? But that's what happens. You know, we're talking about you having a faith that's anchored in who he is and what he says is possible. And, and that word spoken to you. And now if you've never had a word spoken to you, if you've never heard God or, or just felt even that intuitive impression. Most people never hear the voice of God. And listen, let me just tell you, that's fine. Don't worry about that. But you probably have had in the moment, you kind of just knew intuitively, ah, yeah, no, this is the right thing to do. That's just as much God, especially if it's scriptural and it's leading you to life. Amen. I, that, that's what I want. I, I want my natural desires my natural intuitive responses, my natural understanding, because I've taken the time to put the Word of God in there. I've taken the time to pray and, and, and season my mind to trust Him that when I come against something, it's a, the, 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 the natural response is, this is what the Word of God says here. And it might not be book, chapter, verse. It might just be, logically, this is the concept in this area to follow. Now, are you going to do that? Are you going to live that way? So faith then is not about you trying to figure out how to do things and get God to respond and I have a lack of faith and I need more faith. You know, when Jesus rebuked the disciples about having little faith, little faith is you're not very persuaded of him. So great faith would say, I'm not worried about it. I saw him feed 5,000 people. I saw him calm a storm. 
I'm not worried about it. I don't understand how this is going to happen, but I'm going to take a nap too because I know who he is. And he said he's with me and he's going to walk with me. He's not going to deny me. He's not going to forsake me. His spirit's on the inside of me. Are you kidding me? I'm his child. I'm a child of God. And then he told us stories of who God is that he wants us to believe about God. And that is he's not going to give you stones and snakes if you ask for bread. Like if you want to believe things about God, look how Jesus talked about God. That's what you get in your mind. That's what you got to take the time to build into your heart so that those are your natural responses when life happens because life's going to happen. Are you with me? Don't you dare let a circumstance shape what you believe about God more than the Word of God. Amen. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that is your responsibility to guard your heart. It's why we do church. It's why we pray for each other. It's why we have classes and write books and all the stuff. It's part of the reason why He gave us the gifts to encourage each other, lift each other up and remind each other. Don't you remember this is what he said? So then you look back at the patriarchs of faith and what did they all do? They all, like Abraham, let me just read you a couple passages here. By the way, you guys said all the passages that I wanted to read, so I'm not going to take the time to go through those because y'all already have a good definition of faith. So let me see. Get back over here. Uh, faith is, this is when, you start, when you think about faith, this is probably one of the most famous ideas that comes up. This is Mark 11. We're going to read 22 through 24. <clears throat> so Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. We kind of missed that part, right? The biggest opposition to the Word of God bearing fruit in your life is doubt in your heart. You know, when, when the disciples couldn't cast the, demonic, the, the demon out of the little boy and the disciples came to Jesus and he said, why couldn't we do it? What did he say? He said, because of your unbelief. Yes. And then he said, this kind, and if you can diagram a sentence, he's not talking about this class of demon because Jesus has authority over every principality and power. Amen? Right. You share that authority. You don't have to go try to figure out how to get more authority in the spirit. Ain't no such thing. You got Jesus, you got it all. Yep. Technically, what he was saying is this kind of unbelief yes. comes out by prayer and fasting. Right. So if you find in your, yourself in unbelief, you can go fast and pray. Now, it's not the act of doing that that makes something happen. It's where you, how are you letting your heart be affected in the process? Am I actually going to go and deal with this doubt? And sometimes, you know, you got a sin issue that you just can't conquer. You can get to that place of fasting. Not, and it's not, that, it's not that God owes it to you because you've done the act. Right. And it's not the obedient act of fasting that causes him to do something special. What it does is it affects your heart in such a way where you can let what he's trying to do actually bear fruit in your life. Amen. Guard your heart. And fasting can guard your heart. So... Be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. And this is the one I really wanted to read. Verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them and you will have them. That's pretty radical. Are you sure about that, Jesus? Because that kind of sounds like that dude that flies that giant jet on TV that tells me I can have a big old mansion. That's his favorite scripture. But that's not what we're talking about. For Jesus, it looked like, oh, I need to go over there, but there's some water in the way. That's no big deal. That water's going to obey my command and I'm just going to walk. This depression and anxiety on the inside of me, it is no match for the peace of God. Yes. Now, am I going to feast on the word of God that brings me peace in my mind and in my heart to the degree that anxiety has no more space. And the problem is physiologically, we think certain ways for so long that it's like programs our body to crave these things even when it's an unhealthy situation. That's one of the hardest things is when you've programmed your entire body to be depressed. 
It's hard to overcome that, but the Spirit of God is stronger than that. Yes. And it's not that you do something to convince Him to break the depression. It's part, guarding your heart is part of the process. I mean, you can get healed. You can get a miracle. And I'll just, you know, I'll say this. I would rather live my life in such a way where I don't ever need a miracle. Amen. Now, I'll take them. <laughs> Are you with me? And I believe they can happen. But I think a lot of times the reason people can't connect to their miracles is because they're desperate. And I don't mean desperate for God. They're in a desperate situation that clouds their mind and their thinking and their heart. And their heart is not a fertile ground for the Word of God to bear fruit, to do something about that area. So we don't connect. And then we say, well, God must not want it for me. I gave, I prayed, I went to church, I did this, I did that, and it didn't happen. I'm just not going to go to church anymore, and I don't even know. I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. That's foolish. That's unwise, and that's immature. Don't do that. <laughs> you have the responsibility to believe God's track record to believe who Jesus showed us God is. Are you with me? So a couple more verses because this tells us what faith is and how to actually walk in faith because faith will produce life. Faith will, faith is, faith, let me just say this. Faith will, choosing faith, in other words, choosing to respond to God, choosing to trust God, intentionally, in spite of evidence to the contrary, in this life, faith will tend the soil of your heart to be fertile for the Spirit of God and the Word of God to actually do something on the inside of you. Hey, the, the, the picture that I see is this. We've been changed. God has removed that body of the sin of flesh out of us and He's put His new spirit in us. He's put His heart on the inside of us. He's washed us clean with the blood of Christ. He's smeared us with His Spirit. He's put His Spirit on us. Then He gives us His Word as a lamp to our feet. And so He's in us and He's speaking to us and He's guiding us. And then we have the body of Christ to encourage one another. And we have the same authority in this earth that Jesus has because He's given it to us. It's His authority, not ours. Are you with me? Now, where, where are you going to go with that in your mind? So faith is choosing what you're going to focus on and what you're going to believe. And I love this definition here. To me, this is like probably the most technical definition. But faith is not belief in spite of a lack of evidence. Faith is actually the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, say evidence. evidence. Faith is evidence. How is it evidence? The evidence of things not seen for, by it, the elders obtained a good report. In other words, they believed what God said. And through faith, we understand. Say, by faith, I understand. By faith, I understand. We think faith is, well, I don't understand. No. If you're thinking along the lines of faith, you will get understanding. It's just spiritual knowledge. And spiritual knowledge will bring you peace in a way that's better than understanding, but you still get to have the understanding. When you think of things in terms of the spiritual reality of how God works, <clears throat> let's keep going here because it gets better. So through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. What is faith? Faith is trusting God. So by faith, it's like, oh, God said that He spoke and created everything. I agree. That's faith. So by faith, trusting His Word, that's how, you that's how you gather evidence to believe things that He says. Does that make sense? So the evidence that we're gathering is God said this, and then He did it here. It's all throughout the Word. We have 66 books to go into and research the faithfulness of God. Faith is reading those things and then adopting into your mind and your heart the reality that he said this and then he did this and he said this and then he did this and he promised this as a potential. They messed up. So he had to go around this way, but he still wanted to help them. Are you with me? Faith is not. I don't really understand. I don't get it. Faith looks back and says, no, God created everything. So through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen uh, were not made of things which do appear. Faith believes that the things which are not seen can affect that which is seen. Do you believe that? 
or are we trying to manipulate life's circumstances, giving God his blueprint, telling him the steps that he should take to fix our lives? You ever do that? You ever pray and say, God, if you do this, it'll really work out. Trust me. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you don't plan, but are you with me? God spoke and affected or created everything. Jesus sent his word and it healed people. The word is alive and powerful. Now, was it something that came out of his mouth in that spiritual dimension and went, actually went to that person and then manifested and touched him? We don't really, I, don't, I don't really need to know all of that stuff. All I know is that he has authority in this earth to rearrange the molecules of creation because he created them in the first place. When God spoke, it was like math equations boom, shot out of his mouth. And then things operate the way that in his mind as he spoke them at a molecular quantum level, they start, they, they have designed to work a certain way. And then sin came in and broke things. And that's where death comes in and disease and all of that stuff. But when the logic of God comes out of your mouth, it's telling creation how to operate. And it's designed to know how to do that because it knows the voice of its creator because it was designed to follow him in the first place. So when you speak, all of creation hears that and is seeking to then rearrange itself to match the will of God, which is life on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. To me, spirit... And spiritual phenomenon is not just this mystical thing where we don't really understand. And, and again, I'm not trying to boil miracle down to a math equation, but it, but, but it just shows me, man, all of creation is not just sitting there waiting for us to throw up a prayer to God, Him to evaluate it, figure out if He wants to answer or not, wait a month or two or five years or 20 years and then send an answer, but it doesn't really look like what you... No, you speak. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. God gave mankind dominion over this planet. Amen. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were created. It's, it's kind of challenging to get our thinking to that place because that means you've got a responsibility to change <laughs> and not stay stuck where you are. You know, my wife, where'd she go? We've been married 27 years, I think. 27 years? I think so. Uh, and she's been faithful to me, you know? But the reason I can depend on her is because she's been there for me. She has supported me. Never once have I questioned her loyalty, nor mine to her. In fact, hers to me even reinforces mine to her, right? The fact that she's with me has given her life to walk with me through this. You know, I, I don't question or doubt at all because I've watched her for that long, almost 30 years, be right there with me. That, 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 so my faith in her is a response to her faithfulness to me. And that's what God is. God is faithful to you. We love him because he first loved us. Like that's the reason you love God. When you're commanded to love God, it's almost as if the commandment is, hold still and let me love you. Because if we love him because he first loved us and then he commands us to love him, why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Let him love you. So then as an example from the patriarchs, and there's two more passages here, uh, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place which he would receive in, as an inheritance. Isn't that interesting? Because we know what Abraham did. He went and slept with another woman. But yeah, it says he obeyed. Interesting, right? Now, I'm not recommending that that gives you the license to go sleep with another woman. Are you with me? I'm not advocating sin. We're not trying to, we're just saying God sees the heart. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land uh, of promise. So he dwelt in the land of promise. What was the promise? God said, through you, I will bless the whole nations and I will bring you into a land of milk and honey, right? So 
that was what his faith was. Abraham's faith was what it was in what God said. So in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, there the heirs with him of the same promise. And then, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. God is building something. He trusted that God was building something. Do you? Are you walking with him? Or are you grumbling and complaining and staying stuck in the desert for 40 years when it could have taken you two weeks to get through? That was their fault they stayed stuck in that desert. Because they didn't mix faith with the promises. That's a whole other subject, but... Listen to this, this one. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, the one who was supposed to have the child. By, so by, and this, this, this should be us. This is the picture of us. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. Right? Received strength to conceive seed. This is, what God, this is what grace is. God is trying to give you strength to conceive the seed of the Word of God on the inside of you. So, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Do you judge him faithful? Are you with me? What evidence are you using to program your heart? When you try to believe God, when you try to make decisions and think through things about who God is, what evidence are you using to gather those? You guys come on up if you was Chris in here. Yeah. What evidence are you actually using to support into your life? So think about this. Now this might be a little bit weird. <laughs> what else is new? But let's say that you had to give your physical heart to someone else knowing that it was going to cause them to desire things and want things and think new things. What would you do? What would you do for that heart to serve that person? Would you want them to deal with the trauma, unresolved trauma, trauma from your past? Would you want them to eat the kind of foods that you desire? Would you want them to listen to the kind of, you know, the surface level type stuff? But deeper, would you want them to process anxiety and depression the way that you do? Would you want them to process sexual desire the way that you do? Like, what is it that you're programming into your heart? And if you had to then give that heart to someone else, what are you giving to them? And it's not just about what are you drinking and watching and eating and, you know what I'm saying, not at a surface level. We're talking about where you live in your life. When it comes time, when your wife, like John, when your wife is in pain, laying next to you in bed, does it rise up inside of you and say, you know what, something can change right here. Are you ready to be done with this? Because the Spirit of God can make a difference right here, right now. So let's believe. Amen. Our faith should be built on God said this. And I don't care if it takes however long it takes. All that means is, man, the timing thing. Ooh, I'm not even going to go there. If Jesus paid for it, it's yours now. So do you know what he paid for? And are you taking the time to persuade your heart of what he paid for? Do you know what he said about the area of your life that you're believing him for? It's amazing how we say we trust him, but we don't know what his word says about the specific area that we're trusting him in. And we talk about this all the time. Go find some typical study Bible and build a case for yourself based on who God is, based on what Jesus paid for, to believe. Build a case for yourself out of the Word of God as if you are presenting it to yourself as evidence to believe. And then you do whatever it takes inside your mind and in your heart, even if you're wrestling with it. And it's like, I don't like that. You got to let it wrestle in there. You got to wrestle with the Word of God on the inside because it'll change your life. It'll strengthen you. It'll empower you. It'll challenge you. It'll convict you. It might even chastise you. 
It might bring you to the place where you think, oh my goodness, I don't know anything about anything. I kind of hope it does. But then you rebuild and you reprogram and then you live a grounded, mature, stable, Christian, God-honoring, glorifying life that is, is an example to others where you're not running around chasing the next big thing. You're not desperate needing somebody to bail you out because you're grounded, you're stable, you're healthy, you're mature. In spite of the economy, in spite of whatever, socioeconomic, ethnic, and none of that stuff matters in the kingdom. Are you with me? I mean, what kind of economy were the Israelites in for 40 years? Totally dependent on him. He provided every need. And then when they got out, he said, look, it could have even been better. You could have gotten honey out of that rock. I wanted to give you honey. And then what if they'd have gotten honey? What would he say? Well, I could have given you this out of that rock. Go to the Word, build a case for yourself to believe. Because when you believe, whatsoever things, when you pray, if you doubt not, they shall come to pass. Not for selfishness, not for all that carnal stuff, but to look like Jesus on this planet. Amen? Just stand up, if you would, and we'll worship a little bit. But think about that. Think about what evidence have you been believing? What case have you been presenting to yourself? What story have you been telling yourself? Let's just acknowledge His Spirit. Father, I thank You that You live inside of us. I am the temple of the living God. Just say, the Spirit of God lives in me. He's giving me life. He's giving me peace. He's giving me strength. He's giving me wisdom. And He's lighting my path. I trust You, Lord. Your life in me cures all disease. Your peace in me breaks anxiety and depression. Abundant life I receive in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Do you pray in the Spirit? Just pray over your body in the Spirit. If you don't pray in the Spirit, don't worry. We're not going to bring the snakes out. and You may just not understand or use that gift. It's all right. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in this place. You're the whole reason we gather is to worship you, to glorify you, and to lift you up. Father, I thank you for every need in this place and those that are watching and listening. You see those needs before we ever even ask. So I speak life and health into everybody in this place. Every single cell, turn your attention to the Spirit of God and say yes to Him and receive that life. Father, I thank you for the financial blessing that you have for everybody here. I thank you for the power that works in them to be an effective witness for you. And I thank you that we say yes. We trust you and we love you. We praise you, Lord. Just worship him in your own way, however it is. You just speak out to him. Just tell him, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Lord. I want to be led by you. I want to be strengthened by you. I want to let your righteousness that you put in me shape me and transform me. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Just recognize him as Lord and God. You're my Lord and my King. You're my Prince of Peace and you're my strength. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. 
If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.